Welcome back, everyone. That last game was a gem, wasn't it? Yeah, I'd have to say so. You had a uh, new kind of main weapon, optional power-ups, alternate hidden routes. Heck, it even had dialogue, story, and cutscenes in it without being too heavy-handed about it. I'd have to say Mega Man 5 had just a little bit of everything and in just the right proportions. And how about Wily at the end, huh? I know, right? He got really nasty in this one. Must not have liked his first taste of his own machinations turning directly against him. <laughs> this war ends now. What a line. Funny you should say that. You're not going to do something terrible to me again, are you? Depends on your definition of terrible. Oh, no. You see, the next game on the list is... Mega, Mega Man. Man. The, the Wily Wars. Wars. To say the Wily Wars was a hot mess of a game would be a severe understatement. Released in Japan in October of 94 and Europe in April of 95, this remake of the first three titles would never see a US cartridge release, though apparently one was planned, and was only available for download via Sega's Sega Channel starting February of 95. Though that service rotated its library of hosted games, so even then you couldn't be sure it'd be available for download, and even if it was, the Sega Channel adapter would wipe its internal RAM on power down. Thusly, American audiences wouldn't have a guaranteed way to play this without import until it's re-released for the Sega Genesis Ultimate Portable Game Player, releasing a whopping 17 years later. And even then, that version of the game can't use its save functionality, locking you out of the new additional content beyond the remakes. Keiji Inafune is cited as saying the development of this first Mega Man collection was outsourced and rather slow going even describing the debugging procedure as an absolute nightmare and going so far as to help out with the process himself due to feeling bad for the person in charge. He would go on to say later, it was so bad, I found myself saying, I can't believe we made it out of this alive. The ordeal was actually so bad, the entire team questioned rather such a nightmare was truly necessary, leading to a change in procedure that would avoid similar situations in the future. Well, since this is a nightmare, let's dive right on in, shall we? First and foremost, the cartridge versions of this game have a region lock and won't play on their own with a North American console, though using a Game Genie, a code can be used to bypass the regional lockout. An important note about that region lock, though, is that the European and North American systems aren't formatted the same, European versions being specced to use the PAL TVs as opposed to NTSC. While a bit technical in the specifics of why, PAL systems are known to run a bit slower, and good heavens does it feel like it. For the purpose of maintaining Nibor's sanity through this review and playthrough, we'll be running the game at US speed. Thank you. While the Wily Wars may look like a simple collection of the first three titles on one cartridge on the surface, there's a small degree of story ham-fisted into it as well, which goes as follows. Tired of having his plans foiled every time by Mega Man, Dr. Wily decided to build himself a time machine, transporting himself into the past, Wily restored his defeated robots and started causing chaos. At this rate, even the peaceful past was about to be tainted by Dr. Wily's ambitions. In order to stop Dr. Wily, Mega Man was sent into the past in a time machine hastily crafted by Dr. Light to relive his earlier adventures. Oh look, more time travel. This time in the opposite direction. Well, at least this doesn't seem to have caused any continuity issues. Well, while the Wily Wars don't seem to have caused any disturbance in the story of the past, there definitely are some changes to the gameplay, so let's dive in. The first thing the sharp-eyed, or eared in this case, Mega Fan will notice is that the dead air of the first game's title screen has been replaced by the opening theme of Mega Man 3. Dead. Did you really just say Mega Fan? Yeah. Mega Man. Fan. Mega Fan. Fan of Mega Man. Please stop. Okay. Moving along. Obviously, the music and sound effects are going to be a bit different, owing to the different sound chips used by each system. While I by no means find the Genesis sound chip poor, I do have to say that I think by and large it's not a very good match for the Mega Man OSTs, likely due in no small part to the acclimation I felt to the Nintendo style of sound aesthetic established by the prior games. Sound isn't the only style that's changed though, as the vast majority of the sprites have undergone a pretty significant overhaul, largely for the better. Get it? Largely? Because they're bigger. Ow! Did you just shock me? I said stop. Anyway... The sprites are bigger, and usually more detailed as well, though this isn't always the case. I mean, look at this. I get that Proto-Man is, well, a prototype, 
But look how much more detailed Mega Man is in here by comparison. No wonder he wants to shoot the shit out of you. He's got resolution envy. The first game's boss select has been brought in line with the others, trading full sprite pictures for profile close-ups, and Mega Man's also had a few new frames of animation for exiting the weapon select screen. The mid-air one looks particularly good. Still knocks you off ladders, though. The backgrounds have gotten a visual overhaul as well. This upgrade can totally change the feel of some stages, even though the actual playable surfaces haven't changed at all, though overall, I'd have to say this is a really nice touch that brings out a whole new level of flavor for these titles. With a few exceptions. Like this. This is hot garbage. Don't ask me how, but the solid black lack of a background in the original title is so much better than this garbage collage only compounded by the blasphemy done to the original track here. Several of the graphical glitches that were present in the NES original are now absent, such as the severe flickering caused by hyper and crash bombs, as well as the wily machine fights, though this does cause some pretty severe slowdown in certain circumstances, even with the NTSC settings, which can make some fights exponentially easier. Good thing, too, because you remember that pause exploit from the original? Yeah, that's gone. Though if you really want to get cheesy, there's an even bigger exploit in that the boss gate doesn't shut behind you in this version, offering you a very safe place to hide after that initial volley. Curiously enough, the slowdown that was present in the original, such as during the fights with Elec Man and Crash Man, is now absent, which can make those fights actually a bit more difficult. The change-up with bosses isn't always incidental, though, as several of the bosses and even some of the basic enemies have had their AI tweaked. Gutsman now throws his block wherever Mega Man was standing whenever he summoned it. Electman's movement is now more fast and erratic, and he can fire Thunder Beam from anywhere in his arena instead of just particular spots. Bomb Man will now try to get close to you, where originally, crowding him would cause him to try to jump away. The most extreme case in the first game, though, is Fireman, who no longer fights like an absolute berserker, firing his weapon at a much more calm pace. Hell, in the original game, I didn't even have the chance to realize his shots left a burning patch on the ground because he was firing them too quickly. Moving on to Mega Man 2. Quickman is now much slower, though he takes less damage from the Mega Buster. Flashman has also had his Buster resistance buffed, and now jumps when you shoot instead of when he takes the hit, akin to Crashman. Metal Man has a new angle of attack added to his Metal Blade volleys that might be a little harder to dodge. Heat Man, on the other hand, now throws his atomic fire shots at a higher arc, making them easier to avoid. The second form of Wily Machine 2's bouncing shots now bounce a bit higher, which fixed some wonky hitbox issues in the original game, as well as restricting his number of shots on the screen from 3 down to 1. Moving on to Mega Man 3, Gemini Man no longer pauses after firing his Gemini laser after his clone is destroyed. Snake Man will now occasionally leap over the left side gap in his arena back to the center, making dodging contact damage with him a bit more tricky. Magnet Man's Magnet Missiles now have a delay as they go through a turning animation to move toward their target, a flaw that carries over to your version of the weapon as well, and he also no longer cancels his Magnet Shield whenever you take damage. While not an AI change, Hard Man's Hard Knuckles no longer despawn if led off the edge of the screen. Shadow Man now mixes his pattern up randomly instead of following a particular pattern of jump, jump, attack, jump, and due to the sprite and hitbox size changes, his Shadow Blade can't be slid under anymore. But that's not all! Even the Doc Robots have underwent some changes in this remake. Doc Quickman will now occasionally jump and run without throwing quick boomerangs, and can also change the direction he's running without jumping first at all. Doc Woodman's Leaf Shield will now deflect attacks even after he's thrown it, but, in compensation, he also stands still longer after doing so. Doc Bubble Man now only fires his bouncing bubble at, though I have read accounts that, on extremely rare occasions, he will still fire the Water Buster. Doc Heatman's attacks are now thrown at a different angle, making them easier to slide under. Holograph Mega Man now has a teleportation effect for all three of the bots, making finding the one you can hit harder. And finally, Yellow Devil Mark II's Break Apart and Bounce animation now peaks at a uniform height and occurs at more regular intervals as opposed to the more erratic behavior of the NES original. That was quite a <sighs> mouthful. Tell me about it. They may have been little changes, but there were a lot of them. That being said, I noticed a few changes to some of the regular enemies as I was playing through the first remakes as well. Well, the only truly noteworthy one was the flying footholder enemies from the first title. This time around, they feel like they idle on the same altitude for far longer, and don't mesh with the altitude of the next footholder enemy you're supposed to jump on very well either, generally making them feel very irritating to try to traverse. And, uh... Speaking oh, no. of this point in the game... Cover your ears, everybody! 
I absolutely hate that I ever praise the original title for this. At least it wasn't so poorly designed that if you screwed up here, you were just dead. I will give them that. While scrolling enemies out of existence and infinitely respawning them are both still things, for some ungodly reason, the developers of this game thought it would be a good idea to remove the respawning of pre-spawned pickup items upon scrolling away from their screen and then back again, making this... One of the most irritating points of traversal I have ever had the misfortune of traveling in the entirety of the Mega Man franchise. Not only does the change in hitbox make scaling this, the pit of despair's older, meaner sibling that I am now dubbing the Cylinder of Suffering, an absolute bitch, in the extremely likely event that you're going to end up running out of the energy for the magnet beam before you've managed to crawl out of this hell hole and up to the ladder beyond, you have no choice but to commit the ultimate sacrifice for your dishonor only to be raised from the sweet oblivion of death just two screens prior, still devoid of the precious nectar of salvation that is magnet beam energy, forced to languish in a monotonous purgatory of farming these bomb-faced fucktards until you've replaced that which was so carelessly lost, possibly including the life you forfeit just to get back here, only to brave the spiked corridor of woe, not daring to use the forbidden fruit of the magnet beam to cheese the footholders, and return to the cylinder of suffering again, likely to fail. Again, perpetuating an endless cycle of trial, failure, death, rebirth, and monotonous harvest like a modern mechanical Sisyphus. You are. You good? I'm good. So, and I'm almost afraid to ask. Any other changes? Well, not as drastic as that we just covered. There's a few changes to the actual controls, as well as many of the special weapons having had a few tweaks as well, like the aforementioned magnet missile. Leaf Shield now uses one less energy per cast, a full bar giving you 14 shots instead of 9. Crash Bomber has had its radius upped slightly, but not nearly enough to be of any significant help in the notorious fourth boss fight of the Wily Castle 2, the Boobeam Trap. Bubble Lead now has a bit of a hop after firing it akin to Search Snake, making the fight with the Wily Alien just a little easier, but not too much. Hard Knuckle now has a bit of a delay before collision. Speaking of Hard Man, the change to Magnet Missile mentioned earlier makes using it against him much more difficult. Gemini Laser, Needle Cannon, and Shadow Blade all continue through an enemy if it kills them now. Finally, Top Spin got a pretty big overhaul, both making Mega Man invincible for its whole duration and removing the self knockback when you contact an enemy, as well as fixing a glitch that caused drain per frame on the weapon's energy so long as you were still in contact with something even if that something was invincible, which often led to a sudden and complete loss of weapon energy against Shadow Man. As for the controls, the lack of friction in Mega Man 1 and 2 has been removed, but has also been replaced by a short and stuttery delay if you start moving from a standstill. Overall, this change to movement leads to much tighter feeling platforming, especially in jumping puzzles like the disappearing blocks but is also a decent hindrance in areas that require critical movement timing, such as the quick laser gong. It really took a fair bit of getting used to for me. The final change this game features is the ability to save your progress among stage bosses, though not Wily levels, and reload from three save files on the main menu, which displays which bosses and even entire games have been beaten right from the load screen. Which leads me to this game's final and only original piece of content. Once all three of the games have been cleared and saved, you open up Wily Tower, where the Genesis Unit, three new robot masters based off of the Legend of Journey to the West, await. I've saved this bit for last, as because it's new content, I felt it only right to record my first playthrough of it in classic style. But that's going to be for the next video. Until then, I'll see all of you on the other side.